Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Candid Can Candid Conversations with your CPA. Um, we have with us Nate Landu. He is the COO and co-founder of Snowtill, which is based out of California. It's a cultivation company with a lot of other interesting things that they're up to. Um, industry expert who's been around for a few years. He's seen some stuff. He knows some stuff. So I'll let him introduce himself. How's it going, Nate? All right. Thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Nate Landau. I was born in Canada, raised in Israel, and then 12 years ago moved to New York. I was an event planner there. It was a lot of fun and opened up a lot of doors, but my soul wasn't in it. Then in 2015, I was really starting to sense the change of the cannabis industry, and I decided to do something I'd never done before and just quit my job and pack my bags and move to California. Nice. Did you know that you were going to get into cannabis when you moved to California or what was the draw yeah. going state to state or coast to coast? Uh, I mean, I, when I visited California in 2013, I fell in love with the state right away. And then, yeah, I, uh, I never saw a cannabis plant in my life. And then my first trip here, my first experience, you know, seeing live plants with three greenhouses packed with plants. And I talked to the farmer there, like, aren't you afraid? Like, no, it's California. And then right then at that moment, I knew I was going to come back. It took me a year and a half. I knew I wanted to get into cannabis. I had no idea, you know, what I wanted to do. But I just knew that I moved out here. I would figure it out. Now, that's very fair. I remember my first time seeing, like, big girls out in Colorado. And I was like, all right, like, this is a legitimate business. Like, I'm definitely going to get into this. Um, so it's kind of funny, that aha moment. But, yeah, I had to graduate first before I could move out to Colorado. Um, so how did you get it? So you move out to Colorado after spending some time in New York and Canada. What part of Canada were you from? I was born in Toronto, Ontario. I feel like I guess 80% of the population lives there. So that <laughs> makes, <laughs> makes sense. Um, but okay, so you move out to California. How do you get into cannabis for the yeah, first time? And um, then, uh, like, you know, it's hard to believe in 2023, but California for a very, very long time was actually a great place to operate. Because there was no regulation. There was only a few local governments that had a straight out ban. So as long as you had, uh, there was a collective model where you grew on behalf of others. As long as you had enough signatures and you didn't go over 99 plants and you were environmentally friendly, mm -hmm. you'd be left alone. So within two months of not really knowing anybody, I was able to rent a 10 acre farm in Trinity, Weaverville, Trinity County. And this started, uh, the closest I ever came to growing anything uh, prior to getting into it was a basil plant that all I had to do is give it water once and water it once a week. And it sat in its packaging in my wind village in New York. But I just, you know, something inside of me said this is the path I need to take. So I just jumped right into it. I would say like on like the supply chain of cannabis, like cultivation is awesome, but like sometimes it's unsexy and like outdoor cultivation is like definitely unsexy compared to like owning sexy retail shops that look like uh, iPhone stores or have this very high tech indoor grow. Um, so that's very interesting. You're like, I'm going to, I'm going to be a grower. I'm going to do this thing. I guess before I assume like what was your 10 acres, was it predominantly outdoor flower, indoor greenhouse? I, what was so your cultivation techniques? I was, Sorry, was, no. uh, yeah, there was all outdoors. Obviously, I didn't cultivate on the whole 10 acres. I uh, cultivated about a, an acre of it. And it was just doing traditional agriculture, you know, nothing, nothing special. And yeah, it's, you know, it, it seems exciting at the beginning, but very quickly, like, no, this is just a lot of this is an agriculture plant. My biggest plant was nine feet tall, eight by eight. I had to stand on a ladder to, to take care of the top branches. And it was just a lot of hard, monotonous work to do so. A lot of people when they get into the industry are so excited just to do anything. Like the first thing I ever heard of a job in cannabis was um, when I moved to the States, I had a friend that moved with me, but he moved to California and he told me about this thing where you sit down and you cut weed, leaves off a of weed and they pay you to do it, which is trimming. And I'm like, what? They pay you to do it? I would pay to do it. Until I realized what trimming actually entails. I'm like, I, I, I did it for half an hour after a harvest. I'm like, I am paying people from now on to do this. Oh my gosh. I remember I did the same thing out in Oregon one time, like, hell yeah, like brought down a harvest. Like I'm, I want to do this trimming thing. This seems like so much fun. We're surrounded by weed, listening to good music. Um, but very quickly, like the novelty of it wears off and you're like, 
wait, how much I'm only, I trimmed like a quarter of an ounce. I got to do like 16 of these to make a pound. Like this is going to take forever. Um, so yeah, I experienced the same thing with trimming and it's like, but I don't know, you got to get, put your time in, cut your teeth to get into the industry and same with cultivation. Like I kind of have, you know, connections to cultivation and spend some time around them. And it's, yeah, it's hard work. Like once the novelty wears off and it's still always novel and exciting to be in the garden. Like I do always love these plants and being around them, but when you're like hardcore harvesting it and even the cultivating, like planting it, then maintaining it, like it's like months and months of work um, to make sure the run happens successfully. But, you know, when it does, it's a really good feeling. And uh, within three months of doing it, I was in this beautiful forest and I saw these trees around me, all this other vegetation that no one's ever fed them or sprayed them. And yeah. I was force feeding my plants with chemical nutrients and just, it seemed off to me. And then uh, one of my colleagues from New York, the younger brother, which is now my current business partner, Joseph Snow, mm -hmm. uh, he's like, let me put you two in touch. I think you'll hit it off. And then he told me about this note. He watched the Amendo Dope video about no-till living soil. And then he told me about it. And then right then there, a light bulb went off in my head and a deep gut feeling. I'm like, okay, this is what we need because I started educating myself on the cannabis industry and where it's going to go and realizing that although it's still on the fringe right now, it's about to go mainstream and there's going to be tons of money being pouring in. And on a quantity level, I won't be, you know, be able to compete for another two, three, maybe four years, but then I need some kind of market differentiator. And the second he told me about it, poof, went off in my, you know, that was like, all right, this is it. And uh, he, he came, we met in the fall, and we did our first experiment. Uh, that was an indoor. No one prior and no previous sense were ever ever able to, to get the harvest on the in the indoor winter run. And even with it, because of the way the farm was set up, it was the only warm place on the whole farm that every single bug and disease known to mankind decided to come into that room and didn't refuse to leave. And we were still able to make it the harvest. And that just showed us the how amazing this growing method was. And then we decided it's very important to network and be in the mix. So living up, you know, it's beautiful living in Trinity County, but it's a six hour drive to the barrier without traffic. You know, you wanna have a business meeting, you're like, wait, give me two days till I get down there. But it's sustainable. So in July of 2016, we decided to move down to the barrier and start doing the growing methodology indoors. Okay, so you, 2016 is when you moved down to the Bay Area and started doing indoor, and it still is, it's indoor grows with the living soil? Yes, so that so most no-till living soil is done outdoors or in greenhouses. We know of five that are doing it indoors. I'm sure there's some more, but yeah, it's definitely more of a niche thing right now in the cannabis industry. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. And like, I get the living soil thing. It is interesting. Like it is just teeming with life and it has all the food. Um, how big is, how big is your grow? You know, you started in 2016, kind of what have you guys been up to the last five years? Um, is it still just the, the one cultivation or have you expanded to other verticals? Where are you guys at with the business? Uh, so we still have a more boutique size. Uh, it's important for us to uh, focus on quality. There is a lot, you know, there's a lot of learning curve. There's a lot of people that try the living soil for a cycle two, and you just have to be willing to make mistakes and, you know, have problems and to overcome them. And then people after one, maybe two cycles, just give up on it. Uh, we've have purchased a piece of land in Rio Vista, California, went through all the permitting process. It took us over two years just for construction costs to triple on us. And interest rates to go sky high so our debt financer pulled out so we put that project on hold and now we're looking to expanding to other states uh and potentially even other countries okay nice nice and yeah let's, let's touch on that a little bit because like from what i hear california it's a tough state to operate in i was chatting with a I think it was like a retailer from California a few days ago and just, you know, reiterated that he's like, you know, cannabis is highly regulated, but the state of California compared to other states is also highly regulated. And so he's like, we're getting like, you know, slaps twice, essentially. But, you know, what is your experience operating in California? And I guess, like, how would you compare the California market? Do you like it? Are you excited about getting into other markets? Um, what is your take on it as the local? So 
when I moved to California, it had a thriving, amazing, innovative, collaborative industry. The, you know, the, the, almost every cannabis innovation was coming out of California and everyone was working together and then regulations kicked in. And California's motto is, why be difficult with a little bit of effort, you can be impossible. And, you know, and obviously their over regulations is not just for cannabis, but then you throw cannabis into the mix and it's just impossible. The first problem in California, and again, this affects other industries is the local governments have way too much control. So before you can even think of going to the state for, for a license, you have to go through the local government. And most of them will do everything in their power to put stumbling blocks in front of you, starting with making extremely restrictive zoning laws. So there's very few places that you can do. And then because it's federally legal, the landlord has to own it outright. So it's they're going to either charge you triple the price if you're going to buy it, or I've seen four and a half, five dollars a square foot uh, for rent per month. And this, you know, these are, are unsustainable. Then besides that, they're still about 67 percent of all localities in California do not allow any cannabis operations whatsoever in their jurisdiction. So 35 percent of Californians live in a cannabis desert, which means they have to drive over 100 miles to get uh, to find the legal retail shop to get it. So California, it's an hour and a half. Yeah, Jesus, that's real. Yeah, uh, and in California, it's still at the moment still has a prestige. You know, you're a California brand that's very covered in yeah. nationally, internationally. Yep. If California doesn't shape up real soon, they're definitely going to start losing that. And then because of that, it brought in a lot of uh, big money and this. Just like Canada, you know, it doesn't make sense of having millions of square foot of canopy under production when there's such a finite amount in California. Now, the taxes, is, besides all the burdens and regulations, taxes just kill you here. So as a consumer, you have 15% excise tax, then a 10% sales tax. That's a bare minimum. So you're paying 25 bare minimum. But then local governments have their own sales tax. And they could have their own cannabis tax. So there are places where you walk out paying 45% tax on your product. It just doesn't make sense. And that's why about between 70 and 80% of all cannabis transactions in California still happen on the traditional market. Well, that makes sense. And because that's people forget like the, just the sheer amount of layers of taxes. Because they're like, I just think of them as layers. It's like you have the federal tax, then there's state, then there is even local, and then you get into sales and excise. So it's like, and the, to your point, it's that like local one where it's like they can kind of do what they want. And because uh, to your point, because we've now, you know, we've been in many states now and we've seen markets open up over the last five years and they continue to open up. But like, yeah, they can really kind of start to burn you on the tax side. And it's just like it's interesting how much control the actual municipalities within the state are um, because for sure, like I live in Wisconsin, we, we don't even have a medical program. Like we are in the dark ages when it comes to cannabis. Um, but I know just from other states, like even once the state legalizes, there's still going to be a lot of counties within Wisconsin that opt out of the cannabis market because it's still federally illegal. And they can say that and just choose not to do it. And and for sure in Wisconsin, like I used to think like California was just weed was everywhere. Like they were the Mecca. They started it. Like obviously everybody is on board with this. And then I went to visit it and cruise like the nice, beautiful highway along the ocean. And like, I remember trying to get weed in LA and it was just like, it was a task. And I was like, man, like, thank God I came with some. Cause like, it's hard to find actually. Um, and that kind of gave me a chuckle. Cause like, yeah, if you're in Cali is a very strong brand and it like, and for sure, like Humboldt and the Emerald Triangle, it still is. But like, they've had artificial control for so long. Whereas like now that these new states are coming on board, it's like some good flower coming out of Michigan. Maine's pretty solid. Like there's a lot of good, you know, states that are going to try to get that, uh, get that title, so to speak. So yeah, like you're saying, why make it hard with the little work you can make it impossible. Like that sounds like a lot of the local governments and, and even like on the licensing side. So it's like, 
because we'll get involved on some of the licenses. Like we think to start any cannabis business, our philosophy is you need license, the real estate and the funding. Like with those three pillars secured, you can pretty much do whatever you want. Um, but man, it, it used to be like the licensing. That was like the hardest part. But as like more lawyers are getting into this and there's companies being created, like we kind of know how to put together a winning application. And like we're seeing in New Jersey where it's like, much smaller state, 10 million people like Michigan, way bigger state, 10 million people. It's like the real estate piece is like finding something that's green zoned and not green tax is like almost impossible. So it's like, yeah, it's like, it's a thing now where it's like, okay, I, I'm still trying to secure the real estate. And we have some clients where it's like, they even have the funding and the license and like, they're still trying to secure the real estate. And so, yeah, it's always, it's endless in cannabis. And that's why I respect so much of the operators and just the people that choose to get into this business. Um, I'm an accountant. And so like the statistics are like nine out of 10 businesses fail in America, you know, SBA, like small business association stat, you know, fact check me, like cannabis is even harder than that. And so, yeah, it's interesting. And I think we're getting over the hump where like states, states are starting to come around to like lower their restrictions and lower like the you know, because they are kind of killing the industry or helping maintain the illicit industry. But time will tell. I mean, I still live in a state that's medically illegal. So it's it's ridiculous. Some of these states but we're made a lot of progress in the last five years, like for sure. And even in the last compared to the last 10 years, it's crazy. Um, now you brought um, up Wisconsin. Uh, if you do it, just a quick segue. And uh, we'll yeah, get back to our main thing. Uh, I'm also part of the Veterans Action Council. It's a it started in the uh, COVID as a buddy check-in. As we know, unfortunately, veteran suicide rate is mm -hmm. extremely high. Uh, and veterans make up, uh, one, they're one out of 100 Americans, but make up one out of six out of suicide. And one of our veterans is from Wisconsin, and she has to choose between losing his job and consuming a plant that really helps him, and he's a law-abiding citizen, and we're not going to ask him to break the law and lose his job. So... As a group, we are working, uh, we want to be like special ops and concentrate. We work on a national, international level, but we decided we also want to do some work on a state level. And we chose Wisconsin as our first uh, state that we're going to come and uh, help and push the ball there because it is ridiculous. There's no reason in 2023 that you should be ignorant about cannabis. What, yeah, you don't what, have any excuse at this point. Yeah, like, like, what can it do and what will it do? Is it a, a panacea that's going to heal all? Absolutely not. But is there, uh, is there a web? There's a website that has 6,000 peer review medical studies on cannabis. Just for comparison, aspirin has 300. And you can die from oh, aspirin. You cannot die from cannabis. So I look forward. I, it's a side note working with you. You should yeah, be no, living in, in, in a state, yeah, in the state that is uh, in the in the dark ages still. But yeah, let's get back to our main conversation. No, no, I mean, just cause to talk on like the legislation side a little bit, because like it is a it's a huge aspect of what we do in the cannabis industry. Like and that's what also makes me driven towards the cannabis industry is it's still very much a movement as well as an industry. And it's like we're trying to get it to be not just a movement, but like a, you know, a legitimatized industry. And we're well on our way there. And like, I have so much respect for the people that got us there, but like, it even gets lost on me. Like, you know, all I do all day is talk to cannabis operators and a dope CFO. We only chat with, you know, cannabis operators. So like, I forget that, like, not every state is adult use for sure. And some states not even medical. And so we still need to do the lobbying. You still need to go. And again, like the local governments almost have more influence than the bigger governments so yeah you want to lobby at a federal level but also your state and local level um because it's important and like things don't change unless people talk about them you know because it's it's the government they move slow already and so it's like being a catalyst for change is like something we get to do in cannabis and it's still very much needed so definitely stay in touch with me on that uh kind of the veterans council member and or veterans council and kind of anything i can do to help because we are starting to bring to like, there is like a Wisconsin Cannabis Trade Association, but it's very, very small and in an infancy stage. And so I'm trying to get that going as well with some of my other partners at the NCIA. There's some other cannabis professionals living in Wisconsin that are part of the NCIA Educational Committee. And so we're kind of trying to start some trade organization in Wisconsin, because that also, for better or for worse, it does drive legalization forward. If once the state starts to see how much taxes they can make off this, like, hey, we're business owners, we're ready. We'll even pay your taxes, um, which unfortunately drives 
things forward much faster than just like the medical per uses of it. Like this is a real plan. Like we should be able to have access to it. And just as responsible adults should be able to have access, but not the case in all the states. And so, no, definitely still good to keep kind of driving that forward. Um, but yeah, to bring it back though to California and just kind of, I have a few other questions, but I just kind of want to talk about the transition from 2015 ish now to like 2023. Um, how do you think the the industry of California kind of gets out of it? Because to your point, it was, you know, if I were to think of it as like a high point in a trough, it's like, all right, it had like few regulations, a really great growing environment, a great growing culture. You know, so people were going out there, they were being successful, got really regulated and overtaxed. Like, do you have any ideas of how they kind of write the industry or where I guess you see the industry of California specifically going? So right now it hasn't bottomed out, but getting close to it. Uh, a feedback I get from consumers almost across the board is they're like, why? It, it doesn't make sense to them that since legalization happened, the quality, especially of flour and dispensary, has plummeted. And I'm like, well, the, you know, obviously, the like governments of California prefer to deal with a handful of really large farms and thousands of small farms. So I'll just give you an example of an extinction event. Mendocino County, one of the Emerald Tri one of the counties, the Emerald Triangle. Mm -hmm. the, they've had, I don't know, at one point they had 20,000 growers. It's hard to tell exactly how many are left, but there was 800 that have been operating with a provisional license. And now California is forcing everyone to go into annual license this year. But you have to do this thing called CEQA, the California Envir uh, Environmental Quality Act. And you have to show does your project have an impact on the environment or not? But it's the, the qualifications are determined by the local government. Now, this was a month ago, so maybe it's got a little better, but eight out of the 700 people trying to get through the Mendocino cannabis regulations, but the only, only eight made it through the finish line. And they're all outdoor farmers. They don't have the luxury to, okay, I, I go two months without growing. They don't plant. By now, I mean, it's already too late to plant at this point of the season. So yeah. there's definitely an extinction event. We saw at the beginning of the year, a lot of the MSOs, multi-state operators, exit California. So we're at this weird thing where uh, it's losing its attraction because a lot of big players are leaving. This There is a short window where if California does get its act together, that it can go kind of go back to the way it was pre-2018. Where there's a lot of this small to medium sized operators doing amazing things. And we, you know, California is able to keep its prestige. I'm, I would say if I had to make a prediction, I'm not optimistic that that's what's actually going to happen. But like the only way for those farmers in Mendocino is for the mm -hmm. California's government to override the local government, which is this something that doesn't happen in California. The only thing that the California's government has done is the de delivery service. So governments were allowed to prohibit you from delivering into the jurisdiction. And they overrode that. And then 24 cities and the county of Santa Cruz uh, took the California state to court and lost. So that's the one thing that they were able to override. So the state doesn't step in the industry is on the in California is in the verge of imploding. There's tons of uh, companies, even large ones, that cannot pay the there's California taxes, and now California's regulatory body, the Department of Cannabis Control (DCC), now has enforcement uh, arm. And uh, a famous case with Jungle Boys happened last year, where they were disputing the sixty-four thousand dollars that they owned. They owed California. And they broke, they knocked down their doors and seized a hundred thousand dollars in cash. So you know, we're seeing that if they don't do something soon, California's industry is going to disappear, unfortunately. Oh man, because actually have, we did talk about that. We have like current events in our group. And I remember that that came up was it was California specifically where they're having troubles collecting payment for products. So yeah, there's like the whole tax bill. You got to make sure that, but now they're even struggling to just pay for the product that is sold. So it's like, you can just see the cash flow issues. It's like, oh, you sold the product. Someone gave you money. Like you got to pay your bills. Like that's how credit works. Um, 
but it was like, yeah, it was astronomical. And I was like, oh, wow. And it was a very big player that went down. That was, you know, where it was like, wow, if they don't cover their bills, it's going to be a lot of unpaid accounts receivable. I thought I think about it like accounts receivable as an accountant. And I'm like, man, that's gonna be a lot of bad debt on people's books. And so like, just from like a finance side, it's like, yeah, I wouldn't really want to be operating in California. It's just like, it's because there's like, there's other markets now. And so like, if you live there and that's your only option of great, but like now companies who would have looked at California is like, I'm going to go there and open up shop. Like you had mentioned, like that's slowing way down. And even some who have done that are now pulling back out where they were like, nah, I know you have a massive population and a big, you know, market, but like, I'd rather just play this game somewhere else. Um, so at the end of the day, business is a game, you know, yes, it involves our lives and everything, but it's still just like a game that we choose to play and we can play it any way we want. Um, so yeah, that is, that's interesting. How, I guess, did you hear anything about that being a local, like the unpaid invoices and kind yeah, of. So the second largest distributor, uh, I know some of the top employees there are good friends. And unfortunately they all lost their job as a 10 days ago. So that, that, it's that distributor is gone for the retailers owe them $12 million and they owed the brand $16 million. And that they're again, because it's a privately held company, there's a limit of how much information is available, but it looks like they're going into receivership and a bank potentially will buy them, but they definitely have no, they don't have any more employees and they look pretty solid for a while. So, they went belly up, you know, yeah. it, it, it's, it's not looking good for smaller players. And that's, that's kind of the name that like, you just hit the nail on the head. It's like, they were the second biggest distributor and like from the outside looking in for a while, at least like they looked like they were running a tight ship, like, all right, yeah, everything's good. And then, you know, just 10 days ago. So this is very recent. It's like, obviously it went sideways pretty quick where, you know, there's a lot of, un a lot of unpaid bills and a lot of angry investors and employees. And so it's like, man, like, because for every one of those that the public sees, there's a bunch that the public did not see. Um, so yeah, that's interesting. And to your point, you know, there's everything is cyclical. So like hopefully it gets through it. But man, it's it is like it's a shakeup or something that's happening right now. You know, there's it's not gonna just be the status quo anymore. Um, I guess on that note, kind of what are your thoughts about just like the overall <clears throat> um national market? So outside of California a little bit, does Snowtail have any ideas in other states that you'd like to operate in, or just even your just your thoughts on like the East Coast versus West Coast? So, uh, so I'll just start with uh, states that are following California steps, like New York. Uh, they again they have really good intentions, but the last time I checked, they're in a state of twenty million people. There's twelve new dispensaries, twelve adult use dispensaries that open because. They wanted to give 50% of the licenses, the retail licenses to equity applicants. Great mm. intention, but they, the state regulators didn't realize what in what sphere they're operating. At the beginning, they, I have a friend that's going through these motions. They're like, oh, don't you worry. We're going to find you the real estate. We're going to do all the permitting for you, and you're going to get a million-dollar grant to set it all up. And very quickly, they realized that over half the local governments opted out. They're like, oh, finding real estate's really hard. So then he told the operators, okay, just find the real estate and we'll take care of the rest for you. They finally started finding it. They were supposed to have this $200 million budget to fund it, but they didn't make it known for a while that it wasn't government money, is that they hired three people to raise the $200 million. And I think today they raised $15 million. Now, it's becoming this really big mess where people with capital aren't allowed to get a, a retail license yet where uh, th these equity applicants don't have access to capital that they were promised. So a big mess. So that's on a negative side. On a positive state, Missouri, uh, it looks like they are, they might be getting it right. They've been growing extremely fast since they launched at the end of last year. And they are starting an interesting model that I haven't seen yet. And I'll be very curious to see how this works out. And we're definitely looking into it. Is yeah, what they is it? They have, they've had some bigger operators in the medical market. But now mm -hmm. with the new adult use licenses, what they want to do is have only micro business license. So micro business varies from state to state, but it always means there's a cap of 
how many square feet of canopy you can have. So it's anywhere between yep. 2,500 to 10,000. And then you have a manufacturing lab and they have a dispensary. So kind of just like uh, there's some small wineries in Napa Valley where they do everything and that you, know, you can make a whole business because you're, uh, you're doing all the production in house and making, instead of selling it for wholesale prices, you're selling it for retail. And in Missouri, what they're doing to protect that craft industry is they're going to only allow them to work with each other. So all the craft uh, small uh, companies will only work with each other. So the bigger companies can price them out or shake them down or do anything in a lot right, of right. practices. If you're a retailer, you could just be like, well, I'm just going to buy the cheapest product. And if you're a large, op, large, large cultivator, you know, obviously you're going to have the scale. So you're going to have like the cheapest prices. That is interesting. And I've seen it in Michigan. They have a, uh, Michigan's oddly like, they're pretty progressive with their like, their business models as well. So they allow, it's, I believe it's opening. So I'm pretty sure it's very far along, but like canary fields and they, they cultivate, then they process, they have consumption or not because they have retail obviously there, but then they also have a consumption lounge. Um, and like, it's like a music venue. So they might have like a restaurant and uh, music, but it's all in one location. And like, that was their purpose. It's like, yeah, we wanted to create a cool venue where you can come try the product, seeing it growing in various stages. Cause I think it's believes an indoor grow. Um, and then be outside in a nice environment. So it's like, yeah, it's cultivating, processing, retail, consumption lounge, all at like one location. And I'm like, Michigan is beautiful. Like Northern Pier, Michigan, they call it on their like state slogan, but like, it's pretty pretty. So I could see stuff like that happening with these like micro licenses. And in Minnesota, they called it like micro licenses and mezzanine licenses. And what I can tell, I'm not a lawyer, but the, the mezzanine license to me, I think it just allowed them to have like multiple retail locations. It was still like, to your point, a limited canopy space, and but it gives you the ability to cultivate, process, and retail. Um, and I believe micro was just one retail location. Then mezzanine allowed them to have up to three retail locations, and which kind of makes sense. I mean, you can cultivate enough to fill multiple uh, locations. But yeah, that is an interesting business model. And yeah, we'll see. We'll see where it goes, because I know in Illinois, I know I'm jumping around state to state, but like in Illinois, they have the craft grow license as well um, or micro business. But it was capped at I think it's 5K, five K, five thousand square feet. Um, and it can grow up to 14K. But they're in that flux right now where like the big hum, big uh, like upset is they're like they're capped at five thousand square feet and they want to be up to 14. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's interesting to see how these play out. And cannabis is so new. Like we don't have historical data to just point to like hardcore, like, oh, that's exactly how it happened. Like we have some for sure, you know, but like not a tremendous amount like traditional, you know, businesses. Um, circling back on New York, though, because I did hear like, obviously, you know, we're interested there. We were just at MJ Unpacked in New York City. And, you know, there's a lot of a lot of activity, a lot of people talking about it, but it is rolling out fairly slowly. Um, is there any other states that are like, like a New York where it's like, you think the market should be further along, but it's just kind of getting slowing down in your opinion? Uh, so I know Georgia has legalized it medically, I believe in 2015 or 20, like it's been a long time and they're just about to open their first uh, dispensary after all these years. I know also Alabama uh, approved the first round of licenses. And then some commissioner or something's like, oh, just kidding. And they pulled it. And as the lawmaker beer cats don't understand, like, there's people that came with a shoestring budget and somehow were able to secure the real estate and they have just yeah, enough for yeah. operating capital. And like, it, let's say Maryland, it took them three years to, from when they said they're giving out license to the first one to be operational. And you're paying rent and usually absorbing rent that whole time. Like, yeah, yeah. There are so many companies that spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions, just on the waiting game and never able to yeah. open their doors. And, you know, that is not uh, capitalism. That is not free market. No, I no, should, it's, it's like I it's should, very restrictive. Yeah, I should fail or succeed based on my ability. If I'm competent and have yeah. the right business strategy, I should succeed. And if I'm not, I shouldn't, I should fail, but it shouldn't be these unnecessarily, because it's a plant at the end of the day, like in California, there was a cultivation tax where it went up to $161 a pound, regardless of how much you sold the pound for, where every other agricultural crop has 
zero taxes on it and it really shouldn't be. Uh, I'll show you a quick history lesson. This is Azula. It's one of the first words human beings ever decided to carve in clay tablets in Mesopotamia 5,000 years ago. And that means canon. So we nice. have a very, very, very long history of this plant. So it, it is ridiculous. So yeah, unfortunately, I have more examples of states rolling out slowly and not doing stuff properly than states doing it properly. Right, right. And I would say like we have some in the pipeline that could do it well. Like I know Minnesota, I was just in Minnesota a few weeks ago. That's what seems like it could be a solid market, like good population density at around 6 million people. And though they enjoy nature, they have had a medical program, even though it was like pretty small and not really like, I don't even know if they have flower, but like they at least have one. So people are somewhat educated and like, yeah, they have a unique thing too, where like hemp derived beverages um, can be sold at liquor stores. So it'll be interesting. Um, obviously there'll be some bumps along the way, but I think they're, they're going to do a pretty good job of rolling things out. And so, uh, yeah, every state has their hiccups, but I would say they're getting better at rolling things out. Um, but that's just my opinion. But on that note, kind of like, what is your opinion? You know, final question here, just like the future of cannabis in America, kind of like, what are your plans with your business in the future of cannabis? And just where do you see the future of cannabis in America or internationally going um, personally? Uh, yeah, great question. So cannabis, uh, I the vision I see is like the coffee industry. So because coffee can only go in a very short range of temperatures from 18 degrees Celsius to 21 degrees Celsius, there are no insanely large coffee farms. There's tens of thousands of small coffee farmers that because they're small, they're able to really focus and produce really high quality coffee beans. Are there only a handful of coffee chains? Sure, but that's on the... That's on the retail side, on the, right, the other side. end of the supply chain. <laughs> so uh, a lot of things that it, one thing that we focus on in snow till is not chasing the trends because now, regardless of the quality, there's people on Instagram that just you know, care about white ash or that it's purple and all these things that have yeah. nothing to do with actual indicators of quality. Uh, and they, you know, and it's trends, but with cultivation, because you have to grow a plant, by the time you harvest and everything, you probably miss the, the, the train on that. So you know, we are, are growing the one, which is a strain from the 80s. So we're focusing, there, uh, there's this term called land rate. So cannabis, it is a weed at the end of the day, and it's very prolific. And besides the most northern part and, the, and, the, and Antarctica, it grows everywhere around the world naturally. And those, where it grows naturally in nature is called bland rate. So the future for I see is tens of thousands of small farmers producing really high quality land rates because it's the turbine production you get from something growing right next to the equator. You can't replicate that in any other form. And then have that, have a rural farmer in Panama growing Panama red, and they're on the shelf of a premier dispensary in New York. Uh, okay. Another, that doesn't make sense because even like, yeah, there's like Columbia Red and then there's like Thai Sticks and like there's Acapulco Gold. Like there's all these like very specific iconic strains where it's like, yeah, like I drink tequila. I like prefer it to be manufactured and made in Guanajuato, like in Jalisco, Mexico. Um, It's the same as if I could smoke a Acapulco Gold growing there, like in the actual environment. It's meant to be that it's been grown in for hundreds, you know, of years. And I think we will in our lifetime, you know, hopefully we get to international commerce because like. I get wine, you know, it literally gets shipped to my house from all over the world. I'm part of nakedwines.com. I got my cooking club, so I need my wine handy. Um, and I'm able to get wine from all over the world. And so, like, hopefully we get to live in a future where we can get cannabis strains just shipped to us from all over the world. Man, how cool would that be? Um, and I kind of share your same thoughts on the future of the industry. Like, I'm from Milwaukee, so we're like, you know, the beer capital of the world. And so I definitely like, I think in terms of craft out craft beer versus like the big beer, like when even 10 years ago when I was, you know, in my early 20s, it's like you had Bud Light, Bush Light, Budweiser, <clears throat> um, Coors, Coors Light. And that was pretty much it. And those were the five main taps. And But within very short amount of time, those five taps got pushed all the way to the end. And now there's like 10 more local breweries taps. And you can go to any any bar in Milwaukee, I've been told. Um, but there's just they're full of craft breweries like and they dominate the shelf space. Um, and even like my 
bound in my wallet too. Like if I'm buying drinks, it's usually not going to be a Coors or some like big brand, national brand beer. I'm going to drink something local. I, I travel a lot for work. So if I'm in Minnesota, I'm going to find some random Minnesota lager from the Twin Cities and try it. And and it like it it happened like that's how it used to be. And then they consolidated, consolidated throughout the 70s, 80s and 90s. And now it's like they're like deconsolidating or at least like keeping their crafts you know, roots. So even though there's like a lot of these craft brands are now getting bought out by Coors and Budweiser because they got wise to it of like it sells, um, but they're still able to maintain the ownership, maintain their SOPs, maintain how they do things. And so staying true to those kind of roots are like what people want because people want quality. And like, you'll always have those like bush light buyers of beer where it's like just a family event and they just need it. And so like there will be room for large scale cannabis like i believe like i think kind of more like the pre-roll market again just my opinion um but people are wanting that craft craft aspect of it and even like it's the i'm a flower guy but like i know like oils and edibles are becoming far more prevalent and user friendly and so even that's like getting on to the craft level though where it's like it's single batch you know they grew it they process it and they you know package it all within one location or like within one supply chain so yeah, I'm excited for the future of the industry in the sense of like, hopefully quality goes up and we do get, because the diversity will continue. Like they, the pheno hunters and like the cultivars are going to keep crossing strains and making new ones, but it's going to be cool to get access to other ones. Um, just specifically about Snowtail, where can people find you? How can they reach out? Do you guys have any future plans? Are you have any speaking or are you traveling? What's the future for Snowtail? Uh, so I will be, I just found that today, I will be hosting a panel in California State Fair. So that's one thing that California has done in school is that starting last year, they, just like in the State Fair, you, you know, there's the, the blue ribbon for the nicest cow and stuff like that. They now ha have, uh, I think, 37 different medals to give out for different cannabis products. So I will be nice. uh, hosting a panel there on, uh, they're having one day that's dedicated for veterans. So it's going to be Breaking the stigma, and I'm gonna have a um, setting up a really cool panel of people that are just showing different innovations in tech in the cannabis industry to show that we're not just a bunch of lazy stoners. That there's actually yeah. a lot of science and a lot of innovation happening in the space. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, Nate Landau. Uh, we our website is snowtill.com, and uh, we also our Instagram is snowtill organics. I think that's the places uh, you can find us. We, you know, we're all over the place. We uh, go to many events, but that's the one in the media the future. Uh, yeah, we just, uh, it's to know on uh, why we're called Snow Till is because our buds are very frosty, as you can see in the picture in the back. So it looks snowy. My business partner's last name is Snow, and we do no till living soil. So it kind of brings it all together. And like, just to end on, the future is also cannabis being cultivated and agriculture in general doing no till living soil. I just finished this amazing book called Dirt, where this guy shows how every civilization collapsed when they overused their dirt. And it used to be a punishment when you defined the empire. One of the things they would do after they killed all of you and burned your city to the ground is they would sow salt in your field so you would never be able to grow again. Chemical nutrients is doing the same thing. So there's no need. It produces an inferior product, makes the plant weaker, so more susceptible to diseases and pests. And then you have to use pesticides. And it's just this endless loop where it's a lot. And, you know, taking any ideology out of it, just on a plain business perspective, doing no-till living soil cuts out a lot of your CapEx and OpEx. So you're able to reduce a, a higher quality product for lower production costs and it's sustainable. It's a win-win situation. Nice, nice. I appreciate it. And like, that's what we want to do as the CFOs is run sustainable companies that can just run and, you know, scale accordingly forever. So thanks so much for taking the time, Nate. Again, everybody, you know where to find him and Snowtail. Appreciate what you guys are doing. I think it's really interesting, the no-till soil technique, and I hope it starts to kind of catch on and scale within the industry. So thanks so much for your time, Nate. Thank you. Talk to you later.